everyone. It's so nice to see you all here uh, tonight. My name is Amy Coral, and I'm the Curator of Education and Public Engagement. And I am delighted to welcome you to the Museum of Contemporary Art Detroit this evening for a reading and conversation with Rachel Kushner. Presented with the Penny Stamps Distinguished Speaker Series, which was established with the generous support of alumna Penny W. Stamps. The speaker series brings respected innovators from a broad spectrum of fields to the University of Michigan and outside, to places like MOCAD, um, to um, conduct public lecture and engage with students, faculty, and the larger university, the Ann Arbor, and today, Detroit communities. Um, Rachel Kushner is the author of The Flamethrowers, which was a finalist for the 2013 National Book Award, the Pol Folio Prize, the James Tate Black Prize, and a New York Times Top 5 Novel of 2013. Kushner's debut novel, Telex from Cuba, was a finalist for the 2008 National Book Award, finalist for the Dayton Literary Peace Prize, winner of the California Book Award, and a New York Times bestseller. New Directions recently published a collection of Kushner's wor early work titled The Strange Case of Rachel K. Kushner's Fiction, and, it has appeared in, and her fiction has appeared in The New Yorker, Harper's, and The Paris Review. She is an occasional but longtime contributor to Art Forum and has recently written monograph essays on the artists Jeff Koons, Cy Twombly, Laura Owens, and Martin Kippenberger. She's a recipient of the Guggenheim Fellowship and the Howard D. Vercel Award from the American Academy of Arts and Letters, recognizing the quality of her prose style. We are also pleased to have Lynn Crawford, another of our favorite writers, uh, here this evening. And she has agreed to lead a discussion with Rachel following Rachel's reading. Um, in addition to uh, being a founding board member of MOCAD, Lynn is a Kresge Literary Arts Fellow and a Rauschenberg Writing Fellow. Her articles on art and literature have appeared in Art in America, Parquet, Brooklyn Rail, Hyperallergic, Detroit Research, Book Forum, and Infinite Mile. Her fiction has been um, in Fence and McSweeney's, among others. Her books include Solo, Blow, Simply Separate People, Fortification Resort, and Simply Separate People Too. Shankus and Kiddo, edited, is forthcoming from Ditto Ditto. So basically, we have two incredibly talented women here this evening. Um, won't you please join me in extending an extremely warm welcome to both? With that, I'll turn this over to Rachel. I have to use these glasses because uh, they shrunk all the text in the last few years. Um, it's really great to be, see, and then I can't see out of them. It's really quite annoying. Um, it's really great to be in Detroit. Um, probably everyone says that when they come here to do an event. Um, I wrote a couple words about it. This is not my reading. But if I go freeform, I might forget something. Um, when you grow up watching the neighbor rip up and down the street in his Pontiac GTO, it was a 71, and are as focused as I was on the moment I'd be able to buy my first muscle car. Detroit really is a mecca. Um, it was incredible to me today to walk around and um, see this site of General Motors. I went to the Fisher Body Building today to see the lobby and I took a picture of the ceiling and while I was standing there I texted the photo of the ceiling to a friend of mine who worked uh, on a Fisher body assembly line in Lordstown, Ohio, every summer in order to put himself through college. And um, he, he had told me a lot of stories uh, about working there. And he wrote back immediately. I was reading his note while standing in the lobby. So I'm going to read you what he said. Employees were literally running, not walking, to their cars on break to do enough drinking and drugging to survive the assembly line for the rest of the day. I was run over on the line and had a mangled leg, and because my father was a lifelong GM employee and didn't want to rock the boat, I was taken to the company's own infirmary in the sub-basement which was filled with injured men who had been pressured not to file workman's comp. Once I was on crutches 
and healed enough for the assembly line, a guy would pick me up in a Cushman and bring me to my post. Then he texted me a photograph of a deck of General Motors playing cards with a descriptive line, this is what my father received when he retired from a lifelong uh, journey at General Motors. So, got a set of playing cards. Um, I'm sure he got some kind of pension too. Anyway, being seeing Fisher Body and seeing the former uh, corporate headquarters of GM is really incredible. So <clears throat> I decided to read something from my book that relates to that. Um, this, this is a novel called The Flamethrowers. It came out in 2013. Um, I could have read something more recent, but it seems sort of apt to read something that had to do with um, with cars and maybe peripherally Detroit. So this is a scene from my book. Um, the narrator of the novel is a young woman who has moved to New York City, a uh, young age from Reno, Nevada, and she knows no one, um, is very d disconnected, wants to become an artist, but has no contacts. And she's wandering around one evening and meets these kind of intriguing, but dissolute seeming people. And the scene I will read, um, she is with those people uh, in a bar. Their names are Thurman and Nadine. And they have a friend uh, to whom they introduce her, but she immediately forgets his name and he doesn't divulge it for the rest of the evening. <clears throat> At some point, Thurman and Nadine decided we were going to another bar. You're coming? I asked their friend. I sensed his hesitation before he nodded, sure, under it. Why not? There's nothing better to do. He left his motorcycle in front of the bar because it turned out Thurman had a car. Not just a car, but a car and driver a mid-1950s black and brushed metal Cadillac Eldorado with a chauffeur who looked about 14 years old in a formal driver's jacket that was several sizes too large and white gloves also too large. We piled into the car with drinks in our hands. Nadine had picked hers up and carried it toward the bar's exit and following behind, I thought, yeah, of course. This is how it's done. Thurman paid our tab and I was with them in a Cadillac Eldorado, heavy rocks glasses in our hands, damp cocktail napkins underneath, the ice in our glasses to tinking as the car turned slow corners, honking so people would get out of our way because we were important in that car. Me on their handsome friend's lap our drinks going to tink to tink. This is my favorite, their friend said, pulling a leather date book from a pocket in the car door. It actually comes with the car, the 1957 Brome's own date book. And this, he said, pulling out a perfume bottle from a little cubby in the armrest. The Lanvin Cologne Atomizer with Arpege Perfume. You could order this stuff at the GM dealership when these models were new. Thurman, what else is this thing loaded with? Beats me, Thurman said. Blossom was willed the car. It belonged to Lady Von Doyle. This Blossom had been mentioned several times now. I didn't ask who she was who any of the people they mentioned were. I wanted to study the way they spoke, not interrupt the flow, be the person they had to stop and explain things to. Their friend reached back into the armrest and retrieved a leather-bound flask with a big GM symbol on it, opened it, and sniffed. Scotch, he said. This is true post-Calvinist delirium like the Jews at Sammy's Romanian eating steaks that hang off the plates, a big pitcher of chicken schmaltz on the table. It's all about never going hungry again. He poured from the flask into our glasses. I felt the presence of his body as he leaned. 
I think Lady Von Doyle was Jewish, Nadine said. Thurman, wasn't she Jewish? The friend said that seemed about right for a Jew to drive a Cadillac. In a sense, he said, there is simply this axis of General Motors and Volkswagen. I myself have a VW Bug, a car we associate with Eugene McCarthy and flower power, and not with Hitler who created it. The VW doesn't make you think of Hitler and genocide. It's a breast on wheels, a puffy little dream. The Cadillac, now that's a different dream. Of the two, you'd expect the Cadillac would represent some unspeakable horror, crimes against humanity. Look, here's the brome powder puff, the lipstick case, the pill dispenser, the Evans pocket mirror. All that's missing is the Tiffany cocaine vial and a chrome-plated 44 Magnum. Keep looking, Thurman said. Ha ha, right. You would never be tempted to chrome a 44, Thurm. That's strictly for rednecks and off-duty cops. My point is that compared to the humble little Volkswagen, the GM seems guiltier, more dissolute, and yet there's no genocide or forced labor camps under this leather upholstery, just cotton wool batting. Itself, unlike the beautiful car, not built to last. But these days, only people in the ghetto think it's uptown to drive a Cadillac. In fact, only people in the ghetto think in terms of uptown and downtown. Are you aware there's an oil crisis? Oh, this book takes place in the early 70s, I forgot to mention. I don't even drive my bug anymore with the price of gas, the friend said. I got my little Harley. I ride motorcycles, I said. I mean, I used to, but I sold mine. He looked at me. I was seated sideways on his lap. You do have a kind of tomboy allure, I might call it, yeah. Okay, I told myself. Something is happening here. What kind? What, I asked. What kind of bike did you ride? Oh, a Moto Valera. See, this fits in with my general thesis. It just so happens I know one of them, though he's not involved with the company. I like to rib him about those Valera calendars they print. They pretend the name is about firm Italian tits and desmodromic valves, but actually they used Polish slave labor to make killing machines for the Nazis. Perhaps not specifically, not exactly, but they used some kind of X to make a Y. Fill in your human cost and slick modern contraption of choice. My Valera was a 65, I said, way after the war. Which makes it innocent, he said, just like you. He touched his hand to my cheek, quick and glancing. You don't have it anymore? The Moto Valera? I sold it to move here. X for Y. He had placed his hand on my waist, and I felt heat issue from it. And with that heat, something else, something sincere flowing from him to me, a message or meaning that was different in tone from the way he spoke. I turned toward him. Do you want to know something funny? I said quietly not wanting Nadine and Thurman to hear. Yes, he whispered back, and moved his hand from my waist to my leg. There wasn't really any other place for him to put it in that crowded back seat, and yet I read the gesture of his hand on my leg as exactly that, a man's hand on a woman's leg, and not a hand that had no other place to rest itself. I don't remember your name, I whispered. That is funny, he whispered back. We carried our drinks into a crowded bar, a Spanish place on the ground floor of a hotel, full of color and noise and people they knew. A man called Duke 
with root beer colored chandelier lusters hooked onto his shirt came rushing toward us. He said the lusters were from the Hotel Earl. You're the Duke of Earl, Nadine said. I'm the Duke of Earl, he said, and shimmied his crystals. People crowded around them to say hello. I had the sudden feeling they would shed me. I was a stranger they had picked up in an empty bar, and I was irrelevant now that they'd found their place in a familiar scene. The friend steered us to an empty booth. I slid in next to him. The Duke of Earl joined us. We ordered drinks, and the friend punched in selections on the remote jukebox console. Roy Orbison's voice entered the room like a floating silk ribbon. My mother had his records, I said to the friend. Your mother had good taste, that voice, and the hair, black as melted down record vinyl. Someone passed the Duke a big bottle of soap solution, and he and Nadine took turns dragging on their cigarettes and then blowing huge organ-shaped bubbles. The bubbles were filled with milk-white smoke from their cigarettes, quivering and luminous, floating downward as Thurman photographed them. The next table over wanted the soap. The Duke blew one final bubble of plain lung air. It was clear and shiny, and everyone watched as it drifted and sank, popping to nothing on the edge of our table. You chose this, didn't you? Thurman said to their friend as a new song came on. It was Green Onions by Booker T and the MGs. It's still a good song, the friend said, even if it was stuck in my head for almost a decade. He turned to me and said he'd been in jail. Not a decade, just 30 days. I asked what for. He said for transporting a woman across state lines and Nadine erupted in laughter. I smiled but had no sense of the coordinates of what was funny and why. The man act, he said. Impure intent. What is impure intent? I did some time, and then I was free, but my head was jailed in this song, so it was like I did a lot more time. He hummed along with green onions, nodding his head. At first it wasn't so bad. Green onions was this special secret, something I was hiding, like a pizza cutter up my sleeve. I was pulling one over on them, jamming out to green onions while my fellow inmates were getting their cold shower, eating their pimento loaf, reading letters from women who wanted husbands on a short leash, a really short leash. The men wrote back to these lonely women and did push-ups and waited for the women to come according on visitor's day with their fried chickens and their plucked eyebrows. He had helped the other inmates write their letters to the women. Reach out to your loved ones, 39 cents, a sign in the common room said. You got an envelope, paper, and a stamp. These guys would be working away with a little pencil like they give you for writing down call numbers at the public library. How do you spell pussy, they'd ask. How do you spell breasts? Does penis have an I in it? What, people usually laugh at that part. <laughs> what was the pizza cutter for, Nadine asked. For cutting pizza, sweet Nadine. He gave her a puppy dog smile. When I got out, I thought, okay, unlike a lot of my friends, I know what the inside of a prison is like. Most people don't even know what the outside of a prison is like. They're kept so out of sight, you only know signs on the highway warning you not to pick up hitchhikers. Well, I know about confinement and boredom and midnight fire drills. Amplified orders banging around the prison yard like the evening prayer call. I know pimento loaf, powdered eggs, riots. The experience of being hosed down with bleach and disinfectant like a garbage can. I know about an erotics of necessity. 
Oh, baby, the Duke of Earl said. There's something in that. You think you're one way, you know, strictly into women. But it turns out you're strictly into making do. I am going to melt, the Duke said. Just puddle right in this booth. I had no idea. I don't want to disappoint you, Duke, the friend said. But I'd have to be in prison. And I don't, pl I don't plan on going back. His arm was around me. I was in the stream that had moved around me since I'd arrived. It had moved around me and not let me in, and suddenly here I was, at this table, plunged into a world, everything moving swiftly, but not passing me by. I was with the current, part of it, regardless of whether I understood the codes, the shorthand of these people around me. Not asking or needing to know kept me with them, moving at their pace. When you get released, they dump you in Queen's Plaza at 4 a.m. Guys are darting in and out of the donut shop, wedded in some deep way to prison cafeteria code, drinking coffee, holding a donut in a greasy bag like they've got a bomb, strutting but unsure who they're strutting for now that there's no guard, no warden, no cellmate. They are just random dudes in Queen's Plaza wonderfully, horribly free. That same hour of the night, women and children line up in Midtown to get bussed out to Rikers for Visitor's Day. Buses letting out felons here, collecting visiting day passengers there, while most people are sleeping. The prisons must stay hidden geographically, and hidden in time, too. After I got out, he said, I was incredibly happy. Freedom after confinement is different from plain freedom, which can sometimes be its own sort of prison. The problem was green onions. Weeks turned to months, and it hung around. That surging rhythm was always in my head, and I mean always. He hummed it. It woke me up in the middle of the night, like someone had turned up the volume, and there I was, lying in the dark, listening to the tweedling green onions organ riff, waiting for the guitar parts to cut in, stuck inside its driving rhythm, this groovy song boring out the canals of my brain. It was so unfair because I had paid my debt to society. Green onions came on again, for I think the third time, and it felt to me that the whole room was conspiring in some kind of hoax. The friend hummed it enthusiastically. If you had to hear it for 10 whole years, I said, how can you stand to listen to it now? Because you have to know your enemies, he said. How can you fight if you don't know what you're up against? Who are your enemies? I said I didn't know. See, exactly. Later we danced, my arms around his neck, his t-shirt clinging to his broad shoulders in the heat and sweat of the bar. I had not kissed him, but I knew I would, and he knew that I knew, and there was a kind of mutual joy in this slide into inevitability, never mind that I didn't know his name or if anything he said was true. You're pretty, he said, brushing my hair away from my face. How did you find people in New York City? I hadn't known this would be how. They could put your face on cake boxes, he said. I smiled. Until you show that gap between your teeth, Jesus. It sort of ruins your cake box appeal. But actually, it enhances a different sort of appeal. Some women wouldn't want a man to speak to them that way. They'd say, what kind of appeal do you mean, asshole? Or go fuck yourself. But I'm not those women. And when he said it, my heart surged a little. The hotel, it turned out, was the Chelsea. I don't know whose room it was. Maybe it was Nadine's, a room that Thurman got for her. There was the sense that Thurman helped her out when he felt like it, and that perhaps she was out on the street when he didn't. We were drinking from a bottle of Cuddy Sark. 
and Nadine was not, it turned out, Thurman's wife. From a phone pulled into the hallway, he spoke with his actual wife, Blossom, or maybe he just called her that, not at all tenderly, a nasal, Blossom, I will call you in the morning. He enunciated each word like the sentence was a lesson the wife was meant to memorize and repeat. In the morning, I will call you tomorrow after I've had my Sanka, which sent Nadine into hysterics. Sanka, after he's had his Sanka. After he got off the phone, Thurman seemed energized by a new wildness, as if the compromise of the phone call had to be undone with behavior that Blossom, wherever she was, might not approve of. He put on a bow diddly record with the volume turned all the way up, and when it began to skip, he pulled it from the turntable and threw it out the window. He put on another record, a song that went, there is something on your mind, over and over, with this clumsy but sexy saxophone hook. At the friend's suggestion, I danced with Thurman. He smelled like aftershave and cigarettes and hair tonic. There was something synthetic and unnatural about him, the way his hair formed a perfect wave, and the crispness of his fitted suit, clothing that kept him who he was, a person of some kind of privilege through whatever degraded environment or level of drunkenness. The friend was dancing with Nadine. Her arms were slung around his neck, her strawberry hair over his shoulder. She pressed her hips against him and he pressed back. Watching their bodies make contact, I wished we could trade partners. Well, look at that, Thurman said. Take your eye off her for just a minute. I felt him fumble for something in his suit jacket. Nadine and their friend turned as a unit, slowly one way and then the other. Before I understood what it was, Thurman had retrieved from his coat pocket something body warm and heavy. He was aiming it at them, at the friend and Nadine, who danced to the slow rhythm of the song pressed together and unaware. I heard a click. He was pointing it at them. A deafening bang ripped through me. The friend laughed and asked for the gun and Thurman tossed, Thurman tossed it in his direction. The friend opened it and took out the bullets and inspected them. Blanks, he said, and gave it back to Thurman who grabbed Nadine by the neck in mock violence and stroked the front of her dress up and down with a gun barrel. It seemed a stupid and ridiculous gesture, but she took it seriously and even moaned a little like it turned her on. Thurman put the gun in a cabinet and brought out a new bottle of Cuddy Sark. He poured us fresh drinks and then played Will the Circle Be Unbroken? on the little electric piano that was in the room. Later, he barged into the bathroom while Nadine was peeing, for some reason not in the toilet, but in the bathtub. He looked at her, sitting on the edge of the tub with her mini dress hoisted up. You know what I love more than anything, he said. What, she asked with quiet reverence, as if the whole evening were a ritual enacted in order to arrive at this moment when Thurman would finally tell her what he really loved. I love crazy little girls. He grabbed her and hoisted her over his shoulder, her underpants still around her ankles, carried her into the bedroom and shut the door. You know what they do, the friend said. They shoot each other with that gun in the crotch. Bang, pow. It makes your eardrums feel ripped in half the next day. Isn't that dangerous, I asked. Of course, that's why they do it. The gun went off. Nadine shrieked with laughter. The telephone in the room began ringing. 
The friend and I sat quietly, either waiting for the next gunshot, or for the phone to stop ringing, or for something else. Hey, he said. Hey, come here. But I was already right next to him. I will stop there. Thanks. I think something's supposed to happen now. Okay. I'm supposed to. They said to unwind this, but it looks really um, intricately unified with its stand. could ever ask you would be as interesting as I feel like okay. I feel like nothing everything now is going to just be a downer <laughs> after that <laughs> because it was such a great reading oh. Thank you. And um, when I read this book a, a few years ago, and then I just had the fortune to reread it, my first thought was I would give it to anyone who said the novel's dead. Because it's such a rich, brilliant novel, and in this conventional form, you do so many unconventional, risky things. And um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about some of your influences. Sure. <laughs> um, I mean, uh, is that the question? <laughs> yeah, common okay. question, yeah. I mean, it's a huge question. I don't well, know. Writer uh, influences? Right. I mean, um, I think I'm equally influenced by writers and just by life uh, itself, which is, you're not supposed to say that, um, but the form of the novel, I think, I'm always thinking about what it is because I'm trying to write one, and uh, it's, so, it's, it's hard when you're doing it. Um, and one wonders, like, well, what is the form and why? And that book, The Flamethrowers, was kind of fun and relatively easy to write because I just um, allowed myself to write about things that I knew something about uh, already. And then the form just came along. But I'm, I often am looking for, or I think I should look for, uh, an example as a model of another novel that I, you know, could learn from and possibly emulate, but of course not produce a derivation of, but simply be inspired by in a generative way. And I never seem to find those books. Of course I read a lot, but so widely that probably nothing I read would come to mind as an obvious influence on my own work. And in the case of that book, I don't know. Um, I think that one thing maybe that's a, it's a more recent book, but uh, those two longer novels by Roberto Bolaño, The Savage Detectives and 2666, probably I think had a kind of effect on me in terms of um, what should be done, or when I say should, I mean that I should do, um, what could be done with dialogue. Because he, I, I think that he, um, for me, I, someone who is a scholar of literature could, um, you know, <clears throat> correct me and say something profoundly more convincing, I'm sure. So I'm just talking about my own reading experience. But um, the, he, he's, for me, he seems to kind of uh, re-enliven a method that maybe somebody like Conrad would have used where you have a frame for the novel and then inside of it, that outside storyteller tells you a tale and you forget that he's there and then somebody tells you another tale um, and with Bolaño it's like that times the power of 16 or something, particularly in Savage Detectives, there's a way in which 
certain people take over the narrative and they tell a story and the story becomes important to the reader and the writer and for the book, but you can't say quite how. And the narrator, Arturo Beleno, uh, is not there at all. And you don't really know what part he takes except that he's experiencing these very dynamic personalities of other people or telling their stories to the reader. Um, so I think that, and that and 2666, these two books by Roberto Bolaño, for me somehow merge into each other and become one grand tapestry for how to tell a story and embed these figures in it. So I think that that was probably, um, that book affected me in terms of the way that um, I wanted sometimes the dialogue to, to did the volume just go, uh, to take over um, because the narrator is not, she doesn't have uh, a very strong personality. She's young and impressionable. And so I was thinking about the ways in which other people um, are much stronger and they make their impressions. So in terms of like a center of consciousness, she's not the one doing all the talking. And so I think that, yeah, so Bologna was one influence. But you know, I read widely a lot, of, a lot of different kind of things. It just depends on the day, really. I guess I, I just was thinking you must like reading a lot. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> I mean, it's part of writing in a way. Yeah, I love to read, sure. Um, I, I like movies too. Um, <laughs> I was also thinking how, I mean, in this piece you just read, there were so many examples of, such, of great things in the book, including the stage set. It's almost like it's a diorama. Like there's, there's not just the dialogue and the people, but there's details, like the gun or the, um, the car, the gloves that don't quite fit the driver. You know, later on there's a character whose mother wears these embroidered gowns. And it's almost like it's a visual... Um, you construct this environment for us, and within it, there's the stage acting sort of thing. And I wondered if you could talk about your process a little bit. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, my process is mysterious to me. I wish I had insight into it. Um, sometimes when people say that writing is cinematic, I feel worried, like uh, <laughs> it shouldn't be. Um, you know, like, oh, I really could see the scene like I was there, and you think, well, the novel ideally should do something that only that form uh, can do, and cinema should do what only it can do. And I think that those achievements are separate and different, but one transmuted into the other can kind of become something else. Um, well, yeah, the question was about my process. I, I don't know, I mean, I, that, I think that, I've only written two novels, now I'm writing a third, so I don't think I have a, a really set process for each book, it was completely different. Um, some of it, I guess, was, in both cases, though, was driven by images. It feels like a little febrile to say that as an answer, but I don't mean necessarily a visual image, it could be a poetic image. Um, it's something that I grasp after and um, seems to promise um, mystery, uh, not in the genre form, like something more unanswerable, different kinds of images. Um, in the case of the flamethrowers, I was thinking about like the compound of rubber um, as an uh, industrial material from the 20th century. And then I just started thinking about it more, the way that there were artists who were using rubber in their work in the early 1970s. And I think it's no accident that they were picking it up on the streets in cuttings um, in former manufacturing areas of New York City. So then I started thinking about uh, this arc um, up to like 1977 when the manufacturing age effectively ended in the United States. And that doesn't create like characters and good fiction. So. It's not maybe like a process that's a recipe for any kind of work, much less success. But it just lets me think about things, maybe. Um, and then when I go to write, none of that is explicitly in my mind. It's more like in the back of my head somewhere. And another image, um, I've cited this before somewhere, but uh, probably a few places, but like, Probably 15 years ago, I read an article uh, in the New York Times, um, you know, banal place, but um, about these 
rubber workers in a very remote corner of northeast Brazil who were harvesting rubber uh, during World War II. And they were working, they were hired by the Brazilian government who was working in conjunction with the Allies, so the American government more or less, to make rubber during the war because there was a rubber shortage after Japan um, invaded Malaysia, I think, which is where they grew harvested rubber. And this was wild rubber that they were harvesting in the jungle. It's very hard work. It's a very remote uh, area. And the Brazilian government went to, I'm sorry, this is a long story. The Brazilian government went to uh, these indigenous people and told them, you c this is a true story, you can either enlist in the military and go to Europe uh, and fight Germans, or you can just go to northeastern Brazil and harvest rubber and you will be paid very well and you will live in homes with proper concrete poured foundations and electricity and indoor plumbing, which none of these people had at home. So they went to northeast Brazil and they thought also that they were kind of heroes. They were called rubber soldiers because instead of enlisting to fight in the war, they fought the war at home by harvesting an essential resource for war. Um, these people, as I learned, I've since learned a lot more about them, but in reading that first article, what happened was they went to Northeast Brazil, and it wasn't at all like they'd been promised. They stayed in shacks. Some of them died of malaria. Um, the conditions, the living conditions were very, very hard, and they weren't paid. And the government told them, you know, well, we don't have the money yet, but you will be paid eventually. And they stayed working up there, and it was so remote, and rubber was so profitable for the Brazilian government that they were not told that the war was over. Um, and they brought in women for them, the Brazilians. And so these men married and had children and they trained their sons to harvest rubber uh, in the jungle. And these, they thought, well, if I'm not paid, my son will be paid. And then the sons told themselves, someday there will be a great payment for all of us and they were never paid by the government of Brazil. So this article was an interview with a lawyer who was representing them in a class action lawsuit. And the journalist asked the lawyer, um, so if these men were never paid, what did Brazil do with all that money uh, from harvesting rubber and selling it to the US? And the lawyer said, how do you think the Brazilians built Brasilia? And I had, it's maybe a little didactic or overly schematic, but one image for that book was this question about violence and modernism and just trying to, I mean, now that feels a little silly to say or simplistic or reductive. I mean, I'm, beyond, I'm doing something else entirely, but I think that that was a question that I was having. It was part of my process, was trying to answer it, but, um, in a complicated way that would require an entire novel and that would never answer that question. But you know, that, that's a beautiful scene in the novel, a harrowing scene of the rubber workers. But then there's also those other violent, the motherfuckers and the movement in Italy, the motherfuckers in New York and the movement in Italy and how you kind of balance that kind of violence against the rubber workers. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Oh, sure. Well there, well, there was a real group in New York City on the Lower East Side in the late 60s called the Motherfuckers. Um, that was their name. And one of them, uh, the leader, his name is Ben Maria, had kind of resurfaced in New York City uh, during a, a historical materialism conference. And some friends of mine were there and told me about it and about him. And I became immediately intrigued. I didn't know anything about them. A lot of people do, but it tends to be more people who are uh, kind of on the scene in New York City. This great photographer, Larry Fink, um, had photographed their demonstrations when they were called up against the, sorry, they were called Black Mask. That was more kind of data inflected group. And then they became this um, Amiri Baraka poetry line inspired group up against the wall, motherfuckers, in 1967. Um, oh, some people might know about them because supposedly Ben Morea loaned a gun to Valerie Solanas, which she then went and used uh, very tragically to shoot Andy Warhol. Um, so that's one peripheral thing. But I didn't know anything about that. And when I heard about them, I was interested. I mean, the name is kind of intriguing. It's like slightly tragic in its... Freudian obviousness. Um, 
and I, but I, I was interested in them because they, I mean, they were sort of violent. They, you know, they carried guns and they were serious and they wanted to stage a revolution on the Lower East Side, but they, it was maybe that they were, they wanted to live it um, rather than plan for it as something like a revolutionary horizon, an emancipatory horizon. They said, no, it's happening now. So they had these soup kitchens and they took over buildings and they fed people and they had these happenings and um, it just all seemed really interesting to me and also like lesser known but you know took place in the Lower East Side which is an area I know very well so some things just seem made for fiction sometimes when you get just a little but not all the information. Uh, I eventually met Ben Morea at a party he was really sweet he came up to me and he said you know I liked your book. He was wearing like a 10 gallon black leather cowboy hat and a floor length duster, they call it. He said, I liked your book, but he assumed that the main character was him, which it isn't, but that's okay. Um, I mean, the main leader of the motherfuckers, but he said, but, um, but you made me seem like kind of a misogynist and I love women. <laughs> I feel bad saying this. If anyone's friends with Ben, don't tell him. <laughs> but then can you talk about then the, the movement, the, the radical group in Italy? Yeah, sure. The later part of the book? Well, there were many kind of, um, there were many parallel and sometimes conjoining movements in Italy uh, in the 1970s. Um, it's, and perhaps, the, the, the less violent ones could all be generalized under the term autonomia. The autonomous um, in Italy kind of got started like by 1973 and 74, and then by 1977, when my book takes place, was a sort of crest of that movement. And um, I think people forget what happened in Italy at that time. Um, to a lot of people, it seemed like the, I mean, Italy, when I say the state, it, it's a very new country in a way. A lot of Italians don't really feel like there is one Italy. The North and the South are two completely different worlds. They speak different languages. They have different culture. The North, you know, was very industrialized. And then radically after the war, they rebuilt all the factories that had been bombed. And it has a very, you know, a Northern kind of work ethic. And the South is not like that at all. Um, this is different rhythms of culture came together. But in his mid-70s, it seemed like the state was really going to come apart at the seams. Um, a lot of people joined the autonomous and rebelled and rejected basically the entire structure of bourgeois middle-class life in Italy. So that always seemed interesting to me like whole neighborhoods in Rome would get together and decide to auto-reduce their rent and their bus fare and what they were willing to pay for movie tickets and electricity and water and clothing, et cetera. And, um, and this happened in every major city in Italy. But to the side of all of that is this kind of more sexy and notorious group called the Red Brigades, um, which had a more Leninist sort of um, politics than the autonomous did, who were something more complicated. Um, their politics weren't about a specific horizon that they were moving toward. They were more a rejection of what Italy was offering them on a day-to-day -day basis. But so the Red Brigades, I'm sure some of you know, um, ended up assassinating the leader of the Christian Democrats and former Prime Minister of Italy, Aldo Moro, um, in 1978. And in a way, that murder sort of marks the end of all of the rhetoric and the imagery of a kind of emancipatory post-capitalist state that people had been dreaming of. Um, it uh, was, it resulted in a kind of um, new Italy and the state came down very hard on people and sent a lot of people to prison, including professors and philosophers, people who had just written things that might seem remotely subversive. So a lot of people fled and became fugitives. Um, other people went to prison and ultimately by the 1980s, Italy was kind of, you know, the Berlusconi era. Um, so it was over. So yeah, so I was interested in that time. I think that, um, 
I just happen to traverse it in kind of organic ways in my personal life. I know um, a lot of Italian people and um, my husband uh, it writes about political theory and he has studied and followed that movement in Italy for a long time and we have friends there. So when I decided I wanted to write about it, um, I just started asking people there um, their stories and everybody had these incredible anecdotes, which none of them are really in the book, but it's sort of metabolizing all of that to get a feel for the time that led to uh, writing about it. And the one thing that I haven't, that hasn't really come up tonight is the art community, the art scene that you described so incredibly and, and how, you know, whether the art scene in the 70s and in, in New York and how it, some of the work is tied to some of these things. Um, like minimalism, how Sandro does, you know, different characters do different kind of work, but does that tie into the political thing? Well, maybe, but I, I never want to overtie those things, you know, but um, I came across a work after I wrote my book that seemed to tie them together in a way perfectly. Um, the artist Alighiero Boetti, who later became Alighiero e Boetti, like a doubling and, you know, Alighiero and Boetti. In any case, Boetti is like a, a strange um, figure, somewhat mysterious. Um, and there's a early work that he did, or not early for him, but I think it's from 1970, wait, I'm gonna get this wrong. Does Alicia know? Uh, it's a, a diptych of two paintings. It's either from the late 60s or the early 70s. And one painting is called Rosso Guzzi. And the other painting is called Rosso Gilera. And Gilera and Guzzi are both really famous uh, motorcycle companies in northern Italy, uh, Moto Gilera and Moto Guzzi. Um, and the Guzzi painting is Guzzi Factory Red, and he used factory paint to paint it. And the Gilera painting is Gilera Factory Red, uh, and he used the paint to paint it. And maybe it's a little abstract, but that painting to me is really interesting um, in light maybe of this quote by a famous autonomous named uh, Tony Negri, Antonio Negri, who became a fugitive and had to go and live in Paris or go to prison. He said, you have to understand that in the north at the time of autonomia, Italy was making the fastest motorcycles in the world. Um, and Boetti was involved in the movement and I, I should... I can't explain autonomy in this like context, and you wouldn't want me to, but it comes out of a very significant workers' movement in Italy called the Hot Autumn of 1969, when people in the Fiat plant specifically revolted, and there were, you know, I mean, Fiat was a huge factory. It's like the GM of Italy. So this, these kinds of assembly line riots, like wildcat strikes, um, and really like, uh, type of workers' actions that were totally against the union, just as they were against the bosses. They were for the workers, I think is what Boetti is referring to. But you know, political art doesn't always work. In that case, they look uh, like really kind of fabulous cherry red pop paintings. But if you know that history, you can see something else in them.